But essentially, I've been working with cameras, and I'm going to take you out of the species-specific realm that we've been in through all morning and give you a broad-spectrum overview, a quick dive through the still by marine protected area in False Bay. And I've been working with cameras that are several years in the offing because it was some time ago that scientists decided that cameras were no longer going to be the domain of the Cousteau clan and the BBC Natural History Unit, but they might actually prove useful in helping us to achieve sustainable, low-impact surveys. Um, and that's really where I come from. So, And my background, um, kind of work, working with this, comes from the reef fish and line fishery side of this. And where all this kind of survey technique came from is trying to get a handle on questions, scenarios like this understanding changes in abundance over time, or at least, as you'll see, relative abundance in an area over time due to varying levels of protection as we monitor it, and linked to that, understanding species composition, getting a handle on diversity. But of course, nested within that, and I come from having done my master's on reef fish specifically, but nested well within this diversity and well within a need to monitor the low impact is the chondrichthyan diversity. And so what this talk about is main, mostly about today, really, is looking at developing something that is suitable for our coastline, for monitoring in marine protected areas, that was our specific sort of goal in mind, in a sustainable fashion. That's not to say we don't have a toolkit in our marine protected areas that we can already achieve this with. Um, for those of you who are familiar with a lot of the survey techniques, two of the most prevalent, uh, certainly in reserves along our coastline, underwater visual census, which is scuba dive transects, and controlled angling surveys. Now, any scientific method that you use to assess an ecosystem is going to be fraught with bias. And you try and minimize those, and where you can't, you account for them in your explanations. So it wasn't really the scientific biases that I was really interested in addressing, so much as the logistical challenges that face the conservation agencies on the coastline in monitoring on an annual, sustainable basis. But just as an interesting aside, so that when you see the results, you can kind of put this into context. I don't know how many of you, are, I'm sure a lot of you are scuba divers, but you'll know that scuba bubbles differentially attract and deter a certain species. So that's been highlighted as one of the kind of primary faults uh, with scuba surveys, aside from having the benefit of having a human eye that can seek out cryptic species, species on the seafloor. Controlled angling surveys, obviously, you're going to get your most competitive uh, bait-seeking animals taking the bait first, and you might not necessarily, or well, you certainly very rarely, will get species that aren't attracted to bait, unless of course you're looking to catch data from the same net, etc. But it wasn't that that I was interested in. Um, I was interested in the logistical challenges, and for those of you who dive, you know that having the requisite uh, qualifications, scientific qualifications, to be recognized by the Department of Labor, and to get a boat together and a dive supervisor and a dive team, make sure your dive team know how to identify all the species you can uh, encounter in an area, have fuel in your boat, and then have the weather play along is a huge challenge. So for areas, I mean, we have scuba data that's very prevalent on the nice warm east coast. And suddenly you move to the more turbulent, uh, less visually um, accessible eastern cape. Dwesa Tebe, Amatole, you know, looking at that, you're moving west into the cold areas, and suddenly you have kind of patchy data sets, or you have agencies that can't really get to see on a sustainable basis to monitor like this. Logistically, controlled angling surveys are by their very nature extractive. Um, obviously, they're catch and release, but where the post release mortality of species is not known, to try and avoid that kind of sampling in marine protected areas is surely sort of desirous. That's where the cameras come in. And this was, <laughs> I know, introducing a bit of diversity here. Yeah. So it works on this very simple idea that you put a camera on the seafloor for an hour. And within the field of view of a camera is a bait canister. We fill it with a kilogram of sardines. Um, and that's what we took from the Australians who pioneered this technique. Um, and it's now used sort of as far afield as um, Hawaii, Belize, New Zealand, the Seychelles, and obviously South Africa. Um, and for one hour, you film the life that swims in front of that camera, that it comes to the bait canister, or that might just be passing <coughs> by, attracted by the frenzy around the bait canister, the sheep effect. Um, and we were excited about this because of its potential 
to reduce that element of having someone on the seafloor who has to identify something. And if they call it an elephant fish, you better hope that it was an elephant fish because you can't go back and check it ever. Um, so having verifiable records that you can bring ashore, because I bring all our data ashore, I sit from the comfort of my office, analyze everything with a cup of coffee. If I'm confused about something, I can take a screen grab and send it to someone who knows far better than I do what it is, which in terms of looking at long-term studies is quite a useful addition to our monitoring toolkit. Um, this is quite an interesting thing that we're just picking up on now. So for long-term studies in light of uh, protected area expansion, change in the design of our network, climate change, different focuses on what you're looking at, having a long-term archive is also quite useful. So I have about 300 hours of footage from Falls Bay, and I focused on some of the lionfish species, the reef fish, the chondrichthyans. But in a year's time, someone might be interested in the West Coast lock, 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 rock lobster population that we get on the cameras, or something more specific in terms of behavior. Um, and that's an accessible archive that we really like to set up and, and have available to use. Um, and then lastly, standardization. So having data that, for those of us who are looking at monitoring the MPA network along the coastline, you can take Itimangaliso and make it comparable to Langabarn. Um, and really have some sort of methodology that is utilized across a variety of depths, a, a variety of habitats that you can apply it to, and in a range of conditions that aren't necessarily accessible for divers. So I shuttled off to Stillby for my master's a, a, few, like a year and a half ago now. Um, I finished in February last year. And at this point, Enrico, I'm gonna ask you to just minimize that and fire up the video called Baited Video. Yeah, that's the one. So I'm just going to leave this to play in the background while I chat. Um, I put this together actually for the Lionfish Symposium. So it is targeted towards fish nerds as opposed to shark nerds. So there's going to be a bit of a variety, but it gives you an idea of what the raw data set looks like. Um, <coughs> we put down 29 samples in Stillby. It's a recently promulgated <laughs> MPA. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, camera, you'll see now, camera quality has improved significantly in the time that we've been developing this. Anyway, so we put down 29 cameras. We can only put down one camera at a time, which was the limitation that I had for my study at that time. Um, the camera that we put on the seafloor was linked to the boat by means of an umbilical cord, and it was linked to a control box so I could switch on once it reached the seafloor, and I had a monitor that basically showed me this. So things have got quite a lot more boring actually for me on the boat now that we no longer have that monitor. So having our own version of Nat Geo Wild on the boat was quite great. But I'd sit and watch, see that it was correctly deployed. But the limitation meant that we could only do one site at a time. So on a particularly good day, there you go, there's a bit for you <laughs> coming up now. <laughs> Um, and that's an interesting point because a lot of those sort of smaller juvenile sharks, the smaller ones that are become quite difficult to distinguish in bad visibility, um, certainly if they're far away, if they don't ever approach the bed canister, I could take photographs and instead of myself and my supervisor Colin scratching our heads so that we could send it on to whoever might better be able to tell what it was. Um, and yeah, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but picking up species that you're not necessarily going to get in either scuba or angling surveys. So a lot of the um, literature on grubs, which I'm going to call it now, um, says that the diversity that you record using cameras is a combination. It's sort of the merger of scuba and angling data because you're kind of getting those species that are incidentally in the area that wouldn't take the bait and be brought on board. And you're also getting the species that aren't being pushed away by the presence of a diver. <laughs> I particularly like these little guys. <laughs> I'm just going to let this run a little bit longer because there's quite a beautiful ray that comes a little bit later. And just take note of this and the sort of the reactions to this kind of footage because I've got a point just now about um, where this goes outside the scientific realm, which might not be applicable here, but certainly has been very applicable to my work in Falls Bay. And it's worth bearing in mind as you're watching this kind of imagery, which um, <coughs> is not graphs and stats and, and, and significant p-values, <laughs> but, but it says exactly that. Um, Nico, if you just, just skip a little bit ahead to about here. There it goes, there's an Ray Nielsen come in. Um, <laughs> 
they love these bait canisters, these guys. So you'll see them come in for a, for a nice, the first time I saw the underside of one of these guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can get quite carried away with how you describe these things. If anyone has read my writing, I'm sure will attest to that. There you go. <laughs> okay, thanks. So that was still by. Um, and I was looking at the entire ectofaunal population there, but if I just take out the um, conjunction results, 11 species that we picked up, 29 samples. Um, I had six days at sea in a three month period. I was driving back and forth from Stillby, I had to fit in with Cape Nature's, Cape Nature's as well. But when I compare that to the effort that's required for angling stations or scuba, we have to look at, you know, where is our effort being invested for what kind of output? But that in, a, in and of itself is nice for the still by NPA manager because he was very happy with that, very, very pleased. But it doesn't really say much until we look at comparing it to what the diversity we're picking up on scuba and angling surveys. Now, um, still by doesn't actually have any scuba and angling data available for it, well, not in the format that we could use during my master's. So we used um, surveys from comparable habitat in the region, Tsitsikama Marine Protected Area, uh, the Hokama Marine Protected Area, and Stray Spy. And still, Brav came out with the highest alpha diversity, which is, again, not a unique finding, unique, yes, for our temperate coastline, but it's something that's being touted in the literature, and we wanted to check if it could be corroborated here. Interesting point, the Smeathound shark um, came up most in our, in our surveys, and is typically underrepresented in UVC data sets. Um, this is just an interesting aside, depth, reef profile, and temperature were the sort of variables that best explain differences in species composition across the NPA. Again, not groundbreaking science, but it's something that we needed to check to see if a new technique is able to pick up the same patterns. If you're looking at replacing, um, or like, so certainly replacing angling in marine protected areas, um, obviously not where you're tagging species, like that. But if you're looking at introducing something new, it must be as good as or better than what you already have. So picking up the same trends is a heartening sign. The trick is, I was dealing a lot with the rangers that we were working with, and they loved this. They said, well, we, can, we don't have to get six divers together, and we don't have to, the, the manpower involved is just so much lower, and you don't have to have skilled personnel on the boat, any or anyone. I drop cameras in the water, and I'm you know, not particularly skilled in that regard maybe now, after several hundred hours of it, but, but they couldn't afford the kind of setup. It didn't fit into an annual budget, what, what would work for them. It wasn't particularly time efficient still. One, one hour station is not really that much better than a scuba or an angling survey. Um, but it was scientifically sound. Obviously, we wanted to check and standardize. This was the point that I alluded to when you were watching the video. That has nothing really to do with standing in this conference here, but it's something that I've um, I suggested at the Marine Protected Area Forum a little while ago, and it was met with some sort of lukewarm response, and everyone was like, well, she's young and naive, and she'll soon learn. <laughs> but actually, you know, it's engendering some sort of support and awareness for what lies beneath the waves in our marine reserves, which are this utterly intangible con you know, co um, concept for the majority of people on our coastline, or certainly further inland. Um, using, you know, killing three birds with one stone, using cameras for science management and public awareness allows you to do a lot with the funding that you've been given. Um, so that kind of led to the evolution. Science would be nothing without evolution. Um, and I grabbed around for some funding to put together the development of the next phase of our cameras in false bay. Um, and that was really to address the time efficiency and the cost of it. So during my masters, these little guys kind of burst on the scene and became the go-to camera for anyone who wanted to look back at his legs on a wave. <laughs> um, and so we picked up on these, and actually the footage we were getting from these cheap little cameras was quite a lot better than the footage I was getting with this fancy camera that I'd been given from the sound to use. So Colin and myself came up with this little design in the backyard. That's the whole point of it. Anyone could replicate it. It's not the exclusive domain of scientists, and that was the whole point of what we were doing. And we looked to change things by maximizing data collection. So what I do is I put out four cameras at a time. I could put out 20, I just don't have enough funds for 20 cameras. Um, 
but essentially by buoying them off, so making them independent of the boat, changed everything. So on a good day in Silver, I could get seven hours worth of footage. On a reasonable day in False Bay, moving across much bigger areas, I get 20 hours worth of footage. So basically it works like a fish trap. I just lower the camera onto the sea floor, buoy it off, leave it independent of the boat, buzz around, make sure no one disturbs it, and I come back and pick it up, move to the next area, drop, drop, drop. So it works very easily like that. That's what it looks like. So over here is the GoPro camera, there's a temperature logger over there, and there's the bait canister chain to just absorb some of the shock, and then a rope to the surface with the boys. We can find it again. I actually did 200 sites across False Bay, but not every site had some chondrichthyans present. So the sample sites actually for chondrichthyans is a bit lower than that which I have for bony fish. Um, I started in June last year, um, and I had a summer and a winter survey. My summer survey obviously finishing in January of this year, working between 5 and 50 meters. <coughs> and I'll give you a quick little snapshot. Unfortunately, I didn't put together anything lovely for you guys to see, but that's the one. Um, of what it looks like, essentially, and the kind of uh, species that we're getting. Yeah, so that's very, very surgy conditions. We didn't have much of a choice of when we were going out because we were just trying to get the whole bay as many samples in as possible. That was an unusually beautiful day. That looks like a swimming pool. False bay is never really like that. <laughs> Not often, at, at least. Um, and so, of course, you can see it's much lower to the ground, and that, that'll come up a bit later. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go into it. There's, there's much more interesting sightings that I love sharing with people. There's, we've had 60 species overall in the bay. And so to, to, go, to go and watch the videos and actually see the cool bits that I've edited out and put online, that was, I thought that was the whole of our boat, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we got such a shock. When you're watching things that are like the size of shy sharks, and you're so busy focusing on that, it's only the whole of a, you know, that's a huge bus comes through. Bit of a shock, bit of excitement in my life. So here you go, again, season, depth, habitat, strong predictors of differences in species composition, which is nice that we picked it up, nothing groundbreaking, probably any fisherman in the bay could have told me that, but to have that seasonal difference is quite nice. 19 species, I was quite happy with this. Um, a student at UCT did a survey of the conservation status of, um, actually she worked with Addison I think, and, and Colin, Nikki Best. And um, she picked up on 38 chondrichthyan species in the bay, looking at historical catch data from all the shark fisheries that have been operating in False Bay for a long, long time. So she picked up 19, in, and you must note that this is over like a sort of two week period in June, July, and another couple of weeks in November through to January. It's, it's kind of a small data set relative to what you could get. That's not a bad result, I'm quite happy with that. This is again something that any fisherman would be told you, but puff out of shy sharks everywhere. <laughs> Which I was quite pleased about. So to get endemic sharks, so that the, the ones that aren't necessarily, as we were talking about this at tea, aren't necessarily focused on um, in a lot of studies, but to get some of the endemic sharks that don't come up a lot um, is quite nice. Um, so if you're in false bay in winter, what can you be expecting to see? Well, obviously, Happy Eddie is everywhere. Um, and then the other one, I mean, this was sort of an analysis that I did that looked at species that were characterizing each season, so which species contributed to those differences that we saw. Um, pajama, cat shark, again, one of the others. And those were the most abundant in terms of what we were sampling. If you move into summer in False Bay, your menu sort of opens up a little bit larger as to what you can access. Again, puff out of shy sharks everywhere, smooth house sharks, Tiger cat sharks, this was, you can see over here, that was, I was very excited to get that. You never really see them in the data sets. Um, what I call supin sharks, uh, the short-tailed rays, and some of these little guys, the little rays over here, the eagle rays, oh, sorry. Um, I haven't really gone into depth here because I didn't have time as to why we think this is happening. I've got depth data, I've got temperature data, I've got visibility data. We can obviously put it all together and start you know, easing out a story. My focus for now was development, developing the system and how it was working. But certainly lots of scope here, and once we publish the results of this soon, uh, we can start thinking about why these sharks are in such abundance. So we found sharks, interestingly, um, and the tiger cat sharks and the supins almost more than doubled their abundance in summer. 
maybe we had more sand sites in summer, maybe we had more, you know, it could be a, a variety of things, but it's interesting nonetheless. Um, yeah, just so that you know what you're diving on if you're on reef. And on sand, quite a difference of the species that are that you can find. That is obviously the dark shy shark, um, the picture species over there, and biscuit skate over here. I just put this up because these are some of my favorite finds. Um, in Nikki's thesis, some of, well, a lot of the sharks showed a significantly decreasing trend. Um, and one of these was the Supin shark that has been heavily um, impacted by the lion fishery, which is a motorized ski boat fishery that operates a lot in Falls Bay. Um, so to pick that up on cameras with a non-extractive sampling technique is something quite nice. Uh, St. Joseph sharks, just because I find them <coughs> enchanting. But um, <laughs> funnily enough, they have a mainly invertebrate diet, as far as I know. And so for them to be coming, that was another nice thing. That just because we have a canister of sardines doesn't mean we only get predatory species that are targeting those sardines. And I do this analysis for the, the bony fish that I'm looking at as well. It's nice to see it corroborated among the sharks, rays, and skates too. Um, this is what I call a diamond ray. I think it's also called a backwater butterfly ray or something. Um, before Nikki had a look at the historical catch data, if you look at any reference book, it doesn't really occur in False Bay. I picked it up, Nikki picked it up quite nice that you can kind of now add to a growing data set of sort of unknown species and where they're actually occurring. It's quite exploratory work. Um, this I just put in for, for a laugh. <laughs> it does kind of add a little bit of variety to my day, you know, making a difference for all the shy sharks and catch sharks. Only three of them, unfortunately, in False Bay so far, but nonetheless. So where is this all heading? Um, <laughs> Some of my favorite snaps, where is this all going? Well, the next move, of course, is to be able to obtain fish size. That would be great if you don't have to land something and measure it. It is possible, stereo brub technology is available. Um, we've already you know, tested it in Sitikama. We just have to get the funding. Seon now has some stereo cameras that they are now looking at rolling out and they're going to be using them on a regular basis. Um, so that, that introduces another element to what you can achieve with this. Um, and going deeper. So I'm now working on a rig that can go down to 250 meters and add lights to it. So you can work in worse visibility, work deeper, do more of that exploratory work. I suppose though, uh, in conclusion really, for the sharks, rays and skates of False Bay, to be in a region that has such a long history of utilization, and particularly a long history of fishing impact on species that aren't necessarily well documented. So basic ecological data missing, where skates and rays are lumped in cat data, where we can't really distinguish which Malabata species we're actually speaking about, or you know, then it's really important that we can achieve this kind of ecological information as soon as possible to inform management and conservation. Um, and certainly for our marine protected area goals, um, I'm working this year on doing a, a series of workshops for the conservation agencies along the coastline, but introducing something that might be logistically a little bit easier and might introduce annual sampling into some of the reserves on our coastline. Um, so that's just my team. There's quite a small node of us working with these bros at the moment in South Africa, but it's growing all the time. So get it out there and questions. <laughs>